Good morning, everyone. Welcome, welcome to worship this morning. I hope you've all had a great weekend. It's uh, brisk and chilly outside, but it's a bright and sunny day, and it's good to see so many bright and sunny faces in here this morning. So let us uh, stand and get ready to worship. We'll turn to 56, hymn number 56, To God Be the Glory, hymn 56. To God be the glory, great things He hath done, so loved He the world that He gave us His Son, who yielded His life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth his voice, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he had done. On the third, great things he had taught us, great things he had done. We see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people be joy. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory. Great things he hath done. Amen. I'm a little hoarse this morning. I think I got allergies affecting me, but you guys all sounded wonderful. Good job this morning. Now let us turn to 508. 508, love lifted me. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. Stained within, seeking to rise no more. But the master of the sea, her night is very bright. From the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love. the third. Souls in danger look above. Jesus completely saves. He will lift you by his love out of the angry waves. He's the master of the sea. Billows is with the He your savior wants to be I saw some of you lifting on the love lifted me part, and uh, that's good. Standing up on your toes. I don't know if I can do that as good anymore as I used to. And uh, one of these days, someone's going to jump off the pew. Right, Drew? I'd like to see you do that one of these days. And uh, 
But anyhow, it's, uh, it's good to be together this morning. We pray and trust that you're doing well, and it's always a blessing to gather together here Sunday mornings at Truth Baptist Church. We had a wonderful time yesterday at the Wild Game Supper, and thank you to all those who made a point of coming up and driving up there. Uh, we had uh, a lot of wild meat, I'll just put it that way, and uh, it's, it, it is a wonderful event. And if you didn't get to go this year, We'll hope to see you come next year. It's always a blessing, and uh, really, really enjoyed that. And uh, thank you to all those who made it. We're looking forward to having a good service today. Before we go to the Lord in a word of prayer, I mentioned this in Sunday school, but uh, Helen Wells, uh, her husband Phil, just recently went home to be with the Lord. Uh, I got a call from her granddaughter this morning, and uh, she is over at Memorial Regional. She, they believe she has a bowel blockage. So let's remember. Helen Wells this morning. Uh, I think they have her stabilized and so forth, but let's remember Helen Wells. And, uh, and then I heard from Jean Alexander yesterday, her uh, appointment, her, her surgery that's what's going to be tomorrow is rescheduled for next uh, week. So I think it's next Monday. So remember Jean Alexander, she's going to be having an ablation done with her heart. And then uh, heard uh, from Pat today and Luis is doing well. Uh, the, the hip replacement went well, but that's a process, of course, of recovery. So let's remember her in prayer, as well as a number of others that we're thinking about. Let's pray and ask the Lord's help this morning. Lord, we thank you for this time to be together and to gather together around your word. I pray that you would speak to your people. I pray that you would encourage us as we are here and as we hear from you. I pray that you would give us exactly what we need as we look into your word together. Take us to the place that we need to be. Strengthen us in whatever it is that we're facing. And Lord, we know that we can trust you. Help us to have that resilient spirit that we've been learning about in our connection class hour and all the other things that we've given our time and attention to. Uh, I just ask that you'd be honored and glorified by what happens here today. We do thank you and love you. In Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I'm going to ask our ushers to come to the front, and they have a visitor uh, welcome card and a pen, and as they make their way down the aisle, if you are visiting here for the first time today, we would just ask that you raise your hand as they make their way down. Thank you again for coming here and being with us. Uh, it's our pleasure and joy to have you here. If you are visiting for the first time, thank you for making a point to worship with us at Truth Baptist Church. Uh, you might see a number of things uh, in your bulletin. The first thing to remember is there is no evening service tonight, okay? So uh, we're not having our normal 6 o'clock service. Once a month, we do not have an evening service. And so for January, we are not having it uh, this, um, uh, this Sunday. So keep that in mind. And uh, we will uh, be picking that back up next Sunday night. And next Sunday night is going to be our vision night. So if you can remember that. Uh, we will be having vision night uh, the 21st, I believe it is, 6 o'clock, and we'll reveal our theme for the year, and we'll give out some calendars, and we'll just talk about what we're hoping to accomplish in the year 2024. I feel like I'm reverberating a little bit, guys. I don't know if I have both mics on, or maybe it's just, I don't know what it is, but um, if, if maybe we can just turn off the pulpit mic. Thank you. Um, and then also, if we will remember, uh, we do have some things that are forthcoming. And uh, one of the things is we want to remember to sign up for our sight and sound trip. Uh, we're trying to get people to make sure that they've signed up, and then we'll hope to gather payment here by the end of this month. Uh, we are looking forward to doing that the first week of April. And it's going to be Daniel this year, and we're excited about that as we look to that, and uh, we trust that we will have a blessed trip and a blessed time together. Uh, I hope you can make that uh, a part of your spring plans. It's always a blessing to do that. Uh, and to be involved uh, in, with a church uh, family, with your church family, kind of doing something aside from the normal just meeting at church and all those kinds of things. So we hope that we will see you and we'll plan on that. Looking forward to that the first week in April, among a number of other things. So be prayerful about what's ahead and uh, we'll, we'll pray for a good rest of the weekend. And uh, we don't know, maybe a little snow Monday night. I don't know. Kids like snow, right? Come on up, ushers, if you would. Someone is excited back there. Was that? Oh, that was that was our teacher back there that got excited about that. I think teachers want snow days more than the students. And uh, no, I, I I hope that they will. 
you know, around here, if you just get a trace, just a little bit, that's all it takes, you know, that's all it takes. And uh, so we'll see if maybe we get some of that on Monday night. I don't know. And, uh, but pray for it. Pray for it, and you might, you might get what you pray for. Amen? It's time for us to collect the morning offering. I'm going to ask Brother Chick Birch and pray for the offering, please. Amen. Thank you very much, Holly. Now let us uh, stand and we'll sing 327, The Old Rugged Cross. 327, The Old Rugged Cross. And after this, we will sing our hymn or our chorus of the month. The Old Rugged Cross, 327. Till my trouble 
earth is at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. To the old rugged cross I will ever be true, yet shame and reproach gladly bear. Then he'll call me someday to my own far away, where his glory forever I'll share. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross, till my trophies at last I lay down. Okay, and now let us turn or uh, look at our course for the month. Um, that is, I sing a new song. It should be on the back, Paul, as well as in the bulletin. Uh, I will sing a new song. I sing a new song. I sing a new song since Jesus came. Please turn and greet one another.
sing a new song since Jesus came. Where Master, wear a new name, walk a new road, have a new Thank you. You can be seated. Children can be dismissed to Children's Church. Children can be dismissed. And we are in Matthew chapter number 26. Matthew chapter number 26 this morning. We're continuing on in Matthew. We're picking up where we left off last week. We continue with verse 47 this week. And we see now Jesus as he is approached uh, by the magistrates, by the Jewish elders and the priests. And he is now taken into custody. It's been quite a journey we've been on uh, with Jesus as we've followed his life and ministry and now we see what takes place as he is taken into custody by the quote-unquote authorities of the day. And we'll read in verse 47 through verse 56. Here the Bible says, And while he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the people, priests and elders of the people, uh, chief priests and elders of the people. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same is he. Hold him fast. And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. And Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? Then came they and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of a high priest, and smote off his ear. <coughs> Excuse me. Then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword into his place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled and thus it must be. In the same hour said Jesus to the multitudes, Are ye come out as a, against a thief with swords and staves for to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple, and ye laid no hold on me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. I want to think about this truth, and again, uh, we're looking at Jesus, but we're also considering the disciples uh, in this passage, much like we did last week. And my thought this morning is this, fight, flight, or something else. And I'll give you a little clue, the something else is what we want to try to achieve. We'll see that as we uh, conclude the message. But fight, flight, or something else. Let's pray together. Lord, we ask that you would help us uh, as we consider this passage from your word and as Jesus was taken into custody it it's a difficult thing to read in scripture but we also understand that he was completely in control and that this happened exactly according to your will none of this was by mistake none of this was by surprise and so Lord we know that the things that transpire and take place we know we can look to you and trust you in those things as we see here in this passage. Help us now uh, as we think about how this applies to us. And I pray that we would uh, apply exactly what we need to, especially in the final thought that we have in this message together. We thank you and love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Fight or flight. Uh, that's a good thought. 
Uh, sometimes when we're confronted with something that might be intimidating or scary, we might take one of those two actions, and we might default to either uh, fighting or fleeing. Uh, let's just be honest this morning. How many of you are fleeing, folks? If you're intimidated, you're going to fly out of there. You're going to just leave. Come on, be honest. All right, very good. It's okay to admit that. Better than standing there and dying, right? Whatever it might be. Um, now, how many of you would say, hey, uh, I'm a fighter. If there's something that confronts me, I'm going to fight. Okay, there are, a lot of the men are raising their hand there. I like that. The ladies said they'd flee, m- number of them. The men said that they would stand and fight. At least they said they would. And um, so uh, typically as we're confronted with something that is intimidating, that's one of the two responses that we have. I am fascinated with uh, animal shows. I don't know what else to call them. Maybe nature shows is the better. I always called them animal shows as a kid. I've never lost that. I, I love animal shows. I love watching nature, especially on the Serengeti and the plains of Africa. And for a good time, I can watch like a three-hour documentary on what's happening with the wildlife in Africa. And I can get, for a good time, I can do that. And I like to understand lion prides and uh, even the male lions and how they're all vying for that top position. And, and what I especially love to watch are predators going after tasty animals on the prairie or on the, uh, <laughs> on the Serengeti or wherever it might be. I got tasty animals in my mind because we had a wild game supper le- yesterday, so bear with me. Uh, but usually what you see is you see a lion or some large predatory cat uh, in some kind of like tall brush walking through creeping upon what would be antelopes or the equivalent of deer that we have here in North America and and they're about to attack and sometimes they'll go after the the smaller antelopes but they're really fast and hard to catch Uh, so it seems like the 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 animals that the lions love to go after are like the wildebeests they're a little heavier not as fast uh, and uh, very, you know, very, uh, I think, desirable if you were a lion. And uh, so they go after wildebeest. Sometimes they'll take on a big Cape water buffalo if they're bold enough and strong enough. And what I love to watch is occasionally a wildebeest and even more occasionally uh, a, a buffalo will turn on the predator. And rather than continue to, to run away, They'll turn and face the predator, and even a zebra will do this on occasion, and they'll fight. And sometimes we are one of the two. We want to flee when something takes place. We want to fight when something happens. And this is what takes place when Jesus is approached by the chief priests and the elders, and it's either a fight or flight kind of response. Now, it's not recorded in Matthew. I believe it's recorded in John or one of the other Gospels, as they come to arrest Jesus, they ask them if he he is Jesus, and they say, I am, he says, I am he. And when he says, I am he, they immediately all fall down backwards on the ground. And anything that happened after that point was clear that it was happening at the allowance of the Son of God. In other words, this wasn't happening in a situation where he was being overpowered, or where somehow, you know, the, the forces of the day overcame Jesus and he had to submit to being arrested. He was allowing all of this to take place. One of the most important aspects of our lives is the process of knowing and following the will of God. And sometimes we may be tempted to fight or flee from what God is directing in our life. But there is a right and biblical action to take when he is bringing about his perfect will. All of what was taking place in this scene was happening at the will of God. Even though it wasn't pleasant, and it's not a nice thought to think of our Savior being arrested, it was the will of God that this was taking place. And in our lives, we have to understand that the will of God must rule supreme no matter what it is. I love Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And there the Bible says, um, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, 
which is your reasonable service. And then verse 2 says this, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So, those verses talk about the perfect will of God. And God has a will for your life. One of the things that we always said, kind of as a joke, when we forgot what the preacher preached about growing up, and especially in teen Sunday school, um, mom, dad, we'd get in the car, we'd drive home. What did you learn about in Sunday school today? And if we forgot whatever it was about, we would always say, uh, how to know God's will for your life. And the reason we said that is because it seemed like that was always a topic for teenagers or young people. How to know God's will for your life. And when we knew that, they knew exactly that we were lying and saying, you don't remember what it was that you were learning in Sunday school. Uh, but uh, I can remember hearing many messages on the will of God uh, in high school and in college uh, when I went to Pensacola. And they were all very helpful messages. Uh, but when it comes down to it, we should just say, what does God's word say about it? Well, don't be conformed to the world. Be a living sacrifice unto the Lord and be transformed by the renewing of your mind and so that therefore you can determine what the perfect will of God is. So we need to be like transformers. And I have a whole message I've preached about being a transformer. And if you were a child of the 80s, you know what Transformers were all about. And Optimus Prime and the, uh, and the Decepticons and uh, the Autobots. and I mean, I just loved everything about them. But I will say that in a similar sense, although we don't turn into a vehicle or something else, we are transformed into something different when we are saved. And that has to happen in the renewing of our mind daily. Now, God does make us a new creature, praise the Lord for that. But to live as that new creature every day, there's a transformation, there's a renewing of our mind to keep us in that place of being a new creature. Now, thankfully, the Lord loves us, and if we mess up and get off track, we're still His. But let's be in that place of renewal so that we can determine what God's will is. And what we see happening here in our passage is the will of God. As Jesus was being brought into custody, he was also fulfilling the words and will of God the Father. And it was very clear that that's what was going on. And it was happening so that the word of God could be fulfilled. We see that being mentioned a number of times. Here's the question. What can we determine about our responses to God's will from the text? And we'll see this in how some of the disciples responded. Number one, Here's the first thought. Fighting God's will is counterproductive. Now, it might not be counterproductive for one of those wildebeests to turn and fight the predator. Otherwise, they're going to be taken over. But if we think that we can turn ourselves and fight and resist the will of God in our lives, we will be the losers. We're not somehow going to overwhelm God or change God's mind or say, no, Lord, this isn't how it should be, we will end up on the losing side of that. And so when God is bringing about his perfect will in our life, and whatever it is he's doing to accomplish that, to, to turn and fight against that is counterproductive every single time. And we see this in the example of Peter and how he responded here in this situation. Uh, first of all, Judas is being used unfortunately, by the wicked one, to betray Jesus. And in verse 48, he says, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same as he, hold him fast. Verse 49, And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. And Jesus said unto him, notice what he says, Friend. He calls the one who's betraying him, Friend. Not that Judas was a true friend to him, but I believe Jesus wants to be a friend of everyone. He wants everyone to come to know him. And I, th I, th I believe that he still viewed Judas himself personally as a friend, hoping that he could be salvaged through this whole situation. Friend, wherefore art thou come? Then came they and laid hands on Jesus and took him. Now notice verse 51. 
And behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. We know from other gospels that this disciple was none other than Peter. Peter's having not so great a night. Remember what we learned last week? Lord, although all will betray you and all will turn their back on you, I will never do such a thing. Jesus says, this very night you'll do so before the cock crows three times. Peter looks at Jesus, and again, he thinks he can correct Jesus. He thinks he knows better than Jesus. Don't be too critical because we think the same thing sometimes. And he says, Jesus, I, I'd rather die with you than to have that happen. Now, not so much further down the line into the evening, what takes place? Uh, as Jesus is being taken into custody, Peter, who should have been praying but was sleeping earlier, now sees what's happening, and he takes out his sword that he has, and he cuts off the ear of the servant of the high priest. We find out that his name was Malchus. Uh, I can tell you this, Peter wasn't such a good swordsman that with precision he could simply cut off his ear. Peter was trying to cut off his head. And it might have been that he moved at just the right moment and just got his ear. Peter almost committed murder because he was so impulsive. And in that moment, rather than to see Jesus taken into custody, he thinks he's going to be the big savior of the day, take out his sword, and he's going to kill somebody rather than to let this happen. Now, again, Jesus is in complete control. Everyone had fallen down at his word just earlier. And all of this is happening so that the word of God may be fulfilled. Understand a couple of things. Um, God is sovereign and in control of far more than we realize. And I hope that we understand that this morning. I hope we know that God's in control. And g many things are happening at the allowance of, of the Lord. He is allowing things to take place in his sovereignty that we can never fully grasp or understand. And there are moments in our life where we do question that and we wonder, why is this happening? I just shared with you how uh, last this past week there was a classmate of mine that I grew up with and uh, she's the exact same age, 44, uh, that I am. And she was tragically killed in a car accident on I-66. And um, <clears throat> we sometimes wonder that. You know, she has children. And, you know, she's seemingly in the middle of life. Why would her life end like that? And we don't always understand all those things. We don't get it when someone seemingly dies early. And we don't understand why things transpire the way that they do. And sometimes there are situations in our life that cause us to scratch our head. And we just don't know why, and we can't really piece it all together. And maybe it's a relationship issue, or maybe it's some other kind of trouble that we're facing. And we think, why is this going on, and why is this happening, and why am I dealing with this, or why are there people that are, seem to really want to love God and serve God, and, and they're following the Lord, and even those folks sometimes go through some really tragic things. And it causes us to question. But we have to remember that God is sovereign. Colossians 1.17 says this, And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Now this does not mean that we don't have a free will. This does not mean that we can't choose. I'm so glad God gave us a free will to choose. Uh, otherwise, there would really be no real relationship with God. We would just be robotic little entities that he is controlling. But he gave us a free will to choose to love the Lord and to choose to put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm so thankful for that because I had the opportunity to see what the Lord did for me when he went to Calvary and he shed his blood and, and he, he died and was buried. And three days later, he rose from the grave. And when I saw that and understand that Jesus did that for me, when I understood that, I made a choice to call upon the Lord and to be saved. Now, yes, that's an overwhelming thought that the Lord did that, and His grace is incredible. And it's, it's tremendous what God has done. 
But to say that somehow I had no choice in the matter takes away the truth of the free will that God gives to every man. So there's both things. God is in control. God is sovereign. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He says that in his word. And then we have an opportunity to choose the Lord or to reject the Lord. And some people reject God. Some people have the grace of God presented before them. It's clear. And the gospel couldn't be any more clear. And they hear the truth. And they still say, no, thank you, not for me. Or I think I'll be just fine. I don't need to do that. And to me, that's incredible that anyone would ever make that decision, but people do that all the time. They choose to reject the Lord and His grace. But remember, uh, to try to fight against God's grace and try to, to try to fight against His conviction is always counterproductive. Uh, in Acts chapter 9, we see the story of Saul before he became Paul, being confronted with Jesus on the Damascus Road. And I will say, I love it when the Lord intervenes like this. And uh, Paul could have rejected the Lord Jesus here, but he would have been mighty foolish to do so. And we see in Acts chapter 9, beginning in verse 1, you can just listen as I read, the Bible says, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul. Why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? I always love that response, where he asks the question and answers the question in the same phrase. Who art thou, Lord? Notice, and the Lord said, I am Jesus. Praise the Lord. There is no doubt who this was. Listen, when Jesus comes and, and when he convicts you and he shows his grace to you, there is no denying that that's Jesus. It's no surprise that our world today bucks at the name of Jesus. It's no surprise to me that any other false god can be mentioned. And people are respected and given their rights for that. You can even say God, and that's acceptable. A lot of folks want to give acknowledgement of God, but then there's those few folks that talk about Jesus, and they might even be so crazy as to say, my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. <laughs> and when they say that, it, it brings a different tone to everything. Uh, what is the name of that rookie quarterback for the Houston uh, Texans? C all right, all right, all right. C.J. Stroud. And I knew these, I knew our guys, our boys over here would know. And uh, and I don't know much about him other than I know he's a professing believer, but after every game when he's interviewed, he does say, I want to give thanks to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And every time he says it, I just, I like to watch the reaction of the interviewer, of the people that are doing that, that are interviewing him. And, and as quickly as they can, they always try to change the subject. I don't think I've ever heard one of them say, well, that's wonderful that you just said that, CJ. You know, CJ, you're, you know, you're, you're just a spiritual man, and I'm so glad that you shared about Jesus here. You know, what they always say is, oh, okay, okay, now tell us about uh, how much pressure you were under as you were throwing those touchdown passes. They, they, they try as quickly as they can to divert after what, off of what he just said. Why? Because people bristle at the name of Jesus, especially when someone talks about their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But there is no denying who was confronting Paul on the Damascus Road. He said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. What he's saying there is, Saul, it's very hard for you to kick against the pricks, the pricks being an ox goad. It's incredibly hard for you to keep kicking against that goad. Uh, in those days, they would go the ox with a very sharp point 
and that would get the ox the oxen moving along but occasionally a stubborn ox would still refuse to move or would actually kick against it and Jesus is saying to Saul you're awfully stubborn here and you know it's hard for you to continue to keep kicking against this conviction that I'm bringing upon your heart now and he trembling and astonished said Lord what will you have me to do faith came there at that moment and he turned from being a persecutor of the Lord to a follower of Jesus and the Lord said unto him arise and go into the city and it shall be told thee what thou must do what a beautiful picture and what a great example of no longer refuting the conviction of the Lord and fighting against God's will God wanted to see Saul saved and become Paul and can I tell you this morning if you're not saved God wants to see you saved and he wants to see you come to a saving knowledge of him and he wants to give you a new name written down in glory and he wants to bring you from darkness into light and I don't know the individual hearts of every person here but if you're here and you've never trusted in Jesus Christ it's his will that you come to know him and be saved I can promise you that I hope that you'll follow his will and choose him because I can promise you this he chooses you he wants you to know him we see something else fleeing God's will is cowardly Peter made the mistake of trying to fight what was happening I like how Jesus talks to him and he says in verse 52 put up again thy sword into his place for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword now that's not a verse against defending oneself with violence if necessary but it is saying that if you live by the sword uh, typically uh, that's your fate that's the direction that you go if you're looking uh, to start something uh, and if you're looking for violence rather than using it as a last resort verse 53 thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father and he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels Peter don't you know that right now in this instance I could have 12 legions of angels it was said that a Roman legion could have as many as 6,000 soldiers so he's saying right now in an instant I could have 72,000 angels right here put your sword away put your sword away you don't even know the kind of power you're dealing with here oh okay Lord but how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled that thus it must be Jesus then he confronts these who've come to arrest him notice again we're reminded of verse 56 but all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled then all the disciples forsook him and fled so now we see one disciple who's decided to fight after Jesus is brought into custody the disciples they almost kind of look at one another and say let's get out of Dodge and they all flee the Bible says at least temporarily in that moment they run and just as it is foolish to fight against the will of God fleeing from God's will is cowardly and just as foolish Now I don't have the time to turn to Jonah but if you know the story of Jonah it's a classic example of running from the will of God what did God tell Jonah to do he said Jonah I want you to go to Nineveh and I want you to preach against that great and mighty sinful city and I want those people to repent and turn to me and rather than heading east and going to Nineveh he decides to go south to Joppa so that he could sail to Tarshish which was due west he wants to go in the exact direction opposite of where God told him to go and so he does until the Lord throws him overboard and he's swallowed up by a great fish and he lives in the belly of that fish for three days and for three nights now uh, there, there's a lot of deniers Bible deniers who will use Jonah as an example to say you see no one can live in the belly of a whale for three days and for three nights don't you see all the other miracles in God's Word if God wants to keep someone alive in the belly of a whale for three days and three nights he sure can and he did and that must have been miserable I cannot imagine what it must be like in the belly of anything 
let alone in the belly of a great fish that swallows me up. Jonah was humbled. Only then to be regurgitated up on shore by that great old large fish. And then to say, okay, Lord, I'll go to Nineveh. I don't know if the Lord will have a great fish swallow us up, but he might swallow us up in some other ways to get our attention. He might swallow us up in debt. He might swallow us up in conflict. He might swallow us up in grief. He might swallow us up in some loneliness. And listen, I don't think God wants us to be miserable, but God will use whatever he can to get our attention. If we're running from him, God can use anything he wants. If God can use some random big whale to swallow up Jonah, he can do whatever he wants to get our attention. And he will if he needs to. We need to listen and stop fleeing and running away from whatever it is God's telling us to do. You can't run from God. We know this. But man, we try, don't we? And we think, we think in our minds, well, uh, I'm going to take a different route. And, uh, I, and I've heard people say this to me, Pastor, I'm just going to go this way, and if God stops me, then I'll know. Well, you sound like you're mighty unsure if you're going somewhere where you're just going to leave it up to the Lord to stop you because you think he might. We need to say, Lord, show me what to do. It's far better to wait than to just go and say, Lord, do what you do. Swallow me up by the fish, Lord, if it's not your will. Otherwise, I'm going. I, I think it's far better and it would behoove us to wait and say, Lord, I want to just trust you. You show me what I need to do. And if you say it's time to go, I'll go. If you say don't go, I'm not going to go. But I'm going to listen and be sensitive to what you have said. Here's the third thought. And this is the final thing. This is that other option, and that is this. Following God's will is correct. Following God's will is right. The Apostle John was the only one who followed, and he was blessed for doing so. Now, the Bible says they all forsook him, but then we also see from other Gospels that Peter followed from afar, <coughs> but there was someone else that followed rather closely, and that was the Apostle John. So as soon as they forsook, I think John had a coming to himself moment. And he said, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, what am I doing? I, I, I'm not to be running away from this situation. And the Bible records that John followed after the Lord. Now, uh, you can turn there if you'd like, but I'm going to read from John uh, chapter number 18. And the Bible shows us what happens. In John chapter 18, verse 15, the Bible says, And Simon Peter followed Jesus. So Simon had a turning around moment too. He followed, although a little farther off. And so did another disciple. Now John does not refer to himself in the first person. He does not put himself by name into the narrative. But he refers to himself as either another disciple or the disciple whom Jesus loved as he writes uh, this gospel. That disciple was known unto the high priest and went in with Jesus into the palace of the high priest. So John goes actually all the way into the place where the trial is going to take place with the high priest. The Bible says he was known by the high priest. He had more direct access and he went in. We also see that he goes and opens the door for Peter so that Peter can come and make his way in also. Do you know that when Jesus would be later crucified... The next day, there were a number of women that went to the, foot of the, the feet of the cross, or the foot of the cross, but it was the disciple John who was also there. Now, this says a lot about the disciples. They fled, and a lot of them stayed away. It were, the, it were those women, it was those women disciples, followers of Jesus, that came to the foot of the cross. But you know, there was a man there, and it was John. And he was right there with them. And as Jesus was being crucified, although the other disciples had fled, John's right there. And you know what the Lord Jesus says to John on the cross? He says, son, behold thy mother, referring to his earthly mother, Mary. And he says to Mary, woman, behold thou son. He basically, for lack of a better phrase, he hands his mother off to John so that he can be her, her caretaker. And he's given the privilege of bringing in the mother of Jesus into his home and caring for her the rest of his life. But that's not all. 
According to tradition and even in God's word, we see that all of the disciples were martyred and martyred in different ways. But John, when they tried to kill him, according to tradition, was unable to be touched. And so because they could not kill him, they tried to boil him in a vat of boiling oil, according to Fox's Book of Martyrs. Uh, they decided to exile him, and we know that he was exiled to Patmos. And it was there that he wrote the Book of Revelation well into his upper years. Even sometimes later, he would be brought off of Patmos according to tradition. But he lived for a, a, a long time. And while others were were taken and their lives were given for the sake of the gospel. Praise the Lord for that. John was used in a different way. And I believe it was because he always understood, you know, I'm not going to fight and I'm not going to flee. I'm simply going to follow. And he was given a special place in the work of the Lord because he chose to follow. I want to just ask this question. This doesn't need to be a, a message any longer than this. Are you fighting? Are you fleeing? Or are you following? God wants you to follow him. And some of us have heard the same thing preached time and time and time again, and we've decided we're just not going to do what we hear preached. There are some believers, and I've had even some believers tell me, Pastor, I'm not going to do that. I'll do this, this, ABC, but I'm not going to do that. And I've said, and I, and I think to myself, you've already told me, that you're, you've chosen to be disobedient, you're already not going to do that, and nothing's going to change your mind about that. That's not a heart of following the Lord. That's fighting against Him. Some of us have that Jonas syndrome, and we know that God has impressed upon us to do something, to serve in a certain way, to do whatever it might be, and rather than saying, yes, Lord, we run in the opposite direction as fast as we can. And, and can I say, please turn around now before the Lord does something to swallow you up and put you in an experience where you're very miserable and you have to learn the hard way? One of my phrases is, Hastings like to learn the hard way, especially Eric Hastings. He loves to learn the hard way. And I look back on my life, and I've learned some valuable lessons, but I wish I would have learned the easy way rather than the hard way. I've learned my lessons, but they've been hard lessons because there were times where I ran like Jonah did. Or I fought like Peter did, rather than just simply following like John did. I love the example of John in God's Word. As a matter of fact, he's the namesake of our youngest child. We named Johnny John because of the example of John the disciple. John the beloved. It literally means this, the grace of God. It's of Hebrew origin, and it means the grace of God. I love the name. I love everything it represents, and I love the example of the one named John in the Word of God. Now, <laughs> there's all kinds of interesting names today. And isn't it interesting how names come up and they just, it's almost like they become trends. And I won't name any names in case someone's named that here today. But I especially see it as, uh, you know, our kids are involved in Little League or county sports, and half the team is named the same name. And so they're often saying, you know, uh, the person's name, then the last name. I'll just take Mason as one of them. Anyone named Mason here today? We used to have a Mason Wood. Um, Mason is a popular name in recent days. It used to be a, a, a name that was popular years ago. And so it seemed like on one of Johnny's teams, he had like five or six Masons. So it was Mason P and Mason C and Mason Z and Mason S, you know. And, uh, and I would love this. I would love it if we just brought back some Bible names that, that meant something. Now, if you don't have a child that is named with a Bible name, there's nothing against that, nothing wrong with that whatsoever. But I am saying this. Uh, names mean something. And the Apostle John is a man of God who is used of God simply because he followed God. And whether your name means grace or following God or whatever it is, I hope, I hope you have this. I hope you have a desire in your heart to follow God. Because if you follow God, you'll always be on the right path, and you'll always know that you're right in the center of God's will.
Following God is not easy. Sometimes it's a struggle. Following God will put you in places where sometimes you're lonely. Following God will not put you on the in crowd, it'll put you on the out crowd. But following God is the best life you could ever live. Nothing compares to it. And I'd rather live all of my days and the rest of my days out following God than deciding that I think I know better, I'm going to try to fight him, or I'm going to flee from him, or I'm going to try some other way. And you might say, well, pastor, I'm in church this morning. I'm trying to follow God. Good. I'm glad you are. But you know what I'm talking about. Every one of us in our own heart had our own ways that were fighting or fleeing. And I'm saying, let's knock it all off and say, Lord, I'm committing to you. I'm going to follow you today. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. I want to follow the Lord. Some of us would rather fight. Some of us would rather flee. Some of us want to try to decide our own path. But are you willing to follow? Are we willing to say, Lord, I'll take you at your word and I'll believe you and I'll go the way that you've instructed because I want to follow you. I want your will to be known and realized in my heart and in my life. It's you, Lord. It's you alone that I need to follow after. And no one or nothing else. And I'll tell you, sometimes in these days, we are, we are mightily tempted to do something different. Maybe we think to ourselves, I'm going I'm to make this choice. I, I don't know that it's right, but I feel like I want to do it. Or I feel like maybe if I do, God will bless it. Or and I'm not sure of it, but I'm just going to take, take my chance. Don't live that way. Follow the Lord. If you're here and you're not saved, you need to take that step of following him and trusting in him for eternal life and call upon him to be your Lord and Savior. I hope you'll do that this morning. I hope you'll ask him to do what you cannot do for yourself and trust in him and, and be saved once and for all. Why don't you call upon him this morning? Believe him. Know that he has a will for you. But more important than anything else, he wants you to trust in him. Lord, I ask that you would help us this morning. I pray that we would follow you. Help us to have a peace about what your will is. And then once we, once we have that peace, I pray that we would move forward. And that we would know your will and that we would be happy to be associated with Jesus and overjoyed that he has put us in a different place than the rest of the world and gladly take on the mock, the mocking and the ridicule of the world because we're identified with our Lord and Savior. Help us to be quick to talk about him and give testimony of him and just simply follow him with our lives. Lord, there might be some people here today who are fighting, they're fighting hard. There might be some dads who are fighting against being the leaders in their home spiritually and deciding to be in God's word and to be the man of God that you want them to be. I pray that they would confess that and that they would turn from that and become that spiritual leader they need to be. Lord, maybe there's some moms who are fighting against what your word has said and they're, they're listening to what the world is saying. And rather than trying to be a virtuous woman, they're trying to be something else or they think they'd be better off if they took a different path. I pray that they wouldn't give in to that, but that they would follow you. May we all, Lord, repent if we fleed. And may we come back to where we need to be. Sometimes we get off course and we flee and we go in a wrong direction. I pray that we would make that right and come back to you. Help us now. Speak to us. Have your way, Lord, in this moment. May you lead, guide, and direct in this invitation. And I pray that we would ultimately follow you as you've called us. We thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me, please, quietly? I'm going to ask that we keep our heads bowed and our eyes closed. And I'm going to ask that Holly would play a verse or two of invitation. And as she does, we'll take a moment to pray. Maybe we need to start following God again in a certain area. Maybe we need to follow him once and for all and stop fleeing or fighting and, and resisting and just say, Lord, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to 
do what you've instructed. I'm going to follow as you've prompted, as you've convicted. I'm not going to be like Saul and try to kick against the pricks any longer. I want to be like the man he became and finally, finally receive you into my life. Amen. Thank you for being here this morning. It's been good to be together. And uh, we're not coming back tonight, so just remember that. No evening service. Um, Spencer leaves Tuesday for college, so praying for you. Make sure you say goodbye to him. Allie, I think, left right last Sunday, didn't she? And she was here in church and then was taken off in the afternoon. So our college students are going back. Our, our soldiers, our two Army guys, are, are, have gone back and uh, others as well. So just remember these who are only with us at certain times and who are going back, but we'll pray for Spencer as he goes. Uh, it's good to have Steve here, Steve Morris, Tate's dad, and uh, thanks for being with us. He rode up with us to the Wild Game Supper, and uh, I think their church up in, is it, is it Harrisonburg, um, is looking to have a Wild Game Supper at some point or time. But I'm glad that you got a chance to be with us this weekend, and uh, good to see Emma here and Tate, and they're always a blessing. But Tate, would you dismiss us in a word of prayer, please?